The 15th Amendment guarantees the right to vote without regard to race. Like the other Reconstruction Amendments, the 15th Amendment created new rights, required states to respect these rights, and created new powers for the federal government. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of the 15th Amendment was why it was considered necessary at all. And for this, we have to review some earlier adopted portions of the Constitution. The basic commitment of the original U.S. Constitution was to create a representative democracy. Different parts of the government might be chosen by different groups of people, but ultimately, we the people were driving the choices, either directly for the House of Representatives or indirectly for the Senate and the President. When the Constitution was ratified in the 1780s, most states severely limited the right to vote. In most of them, only adult white males could vote, although New Jersey briefly experimented with giving women the right to vote, and some states allowed free people of color to vote. Even for adult white males, the states allowed only those who owned property to vote, although the amount of property differed considerably from one state to another. At the Constitutional Convention, the framers realized they would never be able to reach agreement for a nationwide standard for voter qualifications. So they decided to let the states decide. Whoever a state would allow to vote for its own state house could vote for the United States offices. The new rights conferred in the 13th and 14th Amendments did not explicitly include the right to vote. That was still under the control of the states. However, the 14th Amendment had some language intended to encourage, but not require, states to extend voting rights to free people of color. This provision was found in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Section 2 imposed some consequences on states that denied the right to vote to any of its adult male citizens. This provision would be triggered if the right of adult males to vote was denied on the basis of race, but also on the basis of property ownership or seemingly any other attribute. Now, of course, the text was explicitly limited to males. States would face no adverse consequences under this section if they denied the vote to women, and in 1870, all of them did. Sadly, the 14th Amendment was the first time that any part of the Constitution expressly limited rights only to males. So what would happen if a state limited the right to vote only to its white men and denied the right to its black men? Under Section 2, states had the power to make that discriminatory choice, but they would risk losing seats in the House of Representatives if they did. Some simple math will illustrate how this was intended to work. Let's assume that a state that once had slavery had a population of a million adult men, which would entitle it to 10 seats in the House. Let's also assume that the state is split 50-50 along racial lines. Under the original Constitution, the one that allowed slavery, the three-fifths compromise meant that this state would have had eight seats in the House, even though the enslaved half of the population was denied the right to vote at all. When the 13th Amendment ended slavery, it also ended the three-fifths compromise. This would mean that the former slave state would actually increase its representation in the House, from eight members to ten members. Now, this result would be fine if the newly freed population was allowed to vote, but the former slave states were quickly moving to stop them from doing so. This is what gave rise to Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. A state would have to choose. Either it could allow all of its adult males to vote and have 10 seats in the House, or it could choose to discriminate and receive only five seats. It was a clever idea, but it didn't work. Notwithstanding Section 2, the Southern states were still disenfranchising their non-white voters. These states figured it was worth the risk, because Congress was unlikely to actually follow through when it came time to reallocate seats in the House after the 1870 census. And indeed, to this day, Congress has never relied on Section 2 to reduce any state's representation. Realizing that Section 2 was doomed to fail, Congress chose to enact the 15th Amendment, which was ratified in 1870. The 15th Amendment no longer gives states the choice. 
there is now an individual right to vote without regard to race. Notice that this right to vote without regard to race is a right that cannot be violated by the United States or by any state. That means that this new individual right limited the power of both the federal and state governments. But of course, it was the state governments who were in charge of the voting rules to begin with, and they were also the ones who were discriminating. So the impact was felt at the state level. After the 15th Amendment, states would still decide who could vote, but they were not allowed to restrict the vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Like the other Reconstruction Amendments, the 15th Amendment also gave a new enforcement power to Congress. And again, here's the way that works. Congress had a new area of enumerated power, and if Congress exercised that power, it would limit the ability of states to enact conflicting laws. As it happens, it took Congress a long time to pass any effective voting rights legislation. A few statutes were attempted in the 1870s and then the 1950s, but no law designed to enforce the 15th Amendment had much success until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 